I, I wish I was better at that. I just was never in the moment to think about it like that. To, to steal just something? Take a step back. Come on, man. Or, no, I was a good stealer, okay? I used to steal pictures <laughs> off the wall at the Denver Broncos facility. I don't see yo, the pictures yo. behind you. What's up? Nope, they're not here. I just remembered I'm supposed to bring on the damn picture for the show, right? Next All right, time. I'll get that done. All right, what's up, everybody? Chris Sims on button. We got Paulie Burmeister in front of his fireplace. Uh, two ex-quarterbacks in front of their fireplace. How you doing, man? Everything good? Doing well. You know, I don't need the fire at all. The, the, the sun is out here in Connecticut for the first time in forever. So no fire. Uh, hopefully the sun isn't shining in too bright from the window, which is a problem with lighting, as you know, at this point. Yeah, well, I know. I got windows coming. I got windows on both sides of me here, so I have a little bit of a shadow, but that's all. We, that's it. That's what we're doing. You got to fight through a little adversity. COVID-19 adversity is what we're doing right now. Uh, we got a good pod today. We're going to hit on a few topics. I'm going to talk about quarterbacks a little bit. We're going to talk about a new uniform that was released. And then we're going to get into my top five pass rushers of the draft and talk about and expand. There was a few other guys that certainly jumped out to me uh, as far as outside the top five. But we'll get into that. And just for a little preview, too, Thursday's podcast is going to be doing the running backs, okay? Ranking all the running backs. Very interesting group. I really have liked what I've seen so far. So, yeah, that's what I'm doing right now, Pauly Burmeister. I'm Ron Jaworski, and I watch the film <laughs> in the basement of my house. <laughs> used to watch with Jaws way, way, way back at NFL Films in the old days. Let's start yeah. light. You mentioned it. Yeah. One of the teams has brand new uniforms. It's it, and it is one of your old teams. It's not the Broncos. I think they're still recovering financially from all the things that you stole off the wall there in the complex. But the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, new uniforms, and I, I use the term new loosely, Chris, because as you take a look at them, are they really that much different than what we've seen the last few years? Definitely not. I mean, this is the uniform that, you know, I wore when I was what playing you wore. in my Tampa, right? Yeah. I mean, this is the one you saw them win the Super Bowl against the Oakland Raiders with Warren Sapp and Derek Brooks. But, you know, I, I'm, I like it. I'm all for it. There you he can is. You see there, anybody watching, right? There's me back in the day. Uh, there's Don't pat James the ball, Winston. Sims. Don't pat it. I know. I'm totally patting it. But my arm, I'm in good position. I'm ready to throw a you rocket. Are. You're ready to go. Uh, but you look at Jameis Winston's uniform and then you realize how ugly that uniform really is. Mm. So, so mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's cool. I think it was a, a needed adjustment to the uniform. I like the plain and simpleness of it. I do. It, it looks like they changed the stripe on the side of the pants. And I mm -hmm. like the third Jersey. I think the all pewter look, which I never got to wear is a really, really good look. I like that a lot. That's the best one. That is the best I, one. The, I'm a, the, the red Jersey look. And the, the white jersey look, look just like the ones that they've had recently. And even though I, I do like that gunmetal pewter, I would vote for bringing back the orange ones that they wore way back when they started in like 1976 or 77. That is still their best uniform. I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, like, I think that like the, the NFL should man, mandate by rule. Make them, yes. That yes, that they have to wear like the all creams, wear all creamsicle too. Creamsicle jersey, creamsicle pants. With the oh, old helmet, and that the would look pants. amazing. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want a lot of orange on there. And, you know, I, I need to do this. But, Philip, I'm sorry. I'm going to have my uh, Will Ferrell meatloaf moment again. Go get that <laughs> Broncos picture down there in the basement right there. You can bring it up. It's light. I'm going to show you. Do you, you ever know what he's doing back there? Well, well, he's usually going down there to play Fortnite or doing something like that. But right now, he, he's okay. He's doing something useful. He's in the middle of some schoolwork, so he's not too busy. Uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. But let's go ahead. Let's continue. All right, all right. Let me hit. Let me hit this, and then we'll go from there because I don't want to continue with new news until you get exactly. to see this. All so, right. So, so how, how far did Philip have to travel to, to get this piece of stolen property? I mean, is is he almost he, there? He's it's right below me. It's it's in the basement here with a bunch of other pictures and jerseys that I have. He's coming up mm -hmm. right here right now. So I'm sorry to delay, but I I'm very proud of my thievery. I mean, this was be. a salary cap problem, but this is what I stole see, off the wall, see. everybody. See that yep. guy right there? Yeah. Lower a little bit, a little lower. Lower it a little bit. Okay. Yep. Yep. It's oh, that is Got nice. It? Good turn. Yeah, it's Fine pretty turn good. There. Yeah. You yeah. see the Velcro on the back, right? So they had the Velcro on the back, which the made Velcro it stood no chance 
for yeah. my thievery. You know, you put a kid in New Jersey from New Jersey in a place where things can be stolen. You better watch out. You know, you know, you can take the kid out of Jersey, but you can't take the Jersey out of the kid. All right. <laughs> so it's easy. It was easy to pull that one off the wall. But how did you make it out of the make it out of the complex? It's not like it's a book you can tuck it under your shirt. I mean, everybody had to no. See it. No, I, I, I didn't try to hide it. I didn't want it to look like, you know, total armed burglary. I just walked out and I said, listen, if anybody's going to see it on camera and they have an mm -hmm. issue with it, I mean, I just, I'll bring it back, I guess. I, you know, I didn't think like Mr. Bowen or anybody would call the cops and they would invade my house <laughs> or anything like that. So I, I, as I walked out and as you know, as a quarterback, you're usually one of the last people in the building as far as the players Hopefully. are concerned. Yeah. Right. Yeah, hopefully. Right. If you got a quarterback that's doing the right, you know, things the right way. But yeah, I'm walking out and I just know no players are around. They don't need this anymore. Wah, ripped it off. Gone. See ya. And uh, never had anybody question anything. I, I, I stole probably about three or four pictures that year. Uh, in all honesty, I think I stole a Brandon Marshall picture. <laughs> I took some. Nice. Uh, I, yeah, I took some other guys, too. You know, Brian Dawkins. I think I got one of him down there. So good collection. Good taste in your thievery. And here, here's the final question about it. Once you got out of the building, what kind of car did you put that in back in 2009? Oh, that's a very good question. I was at that time riding the, the Porsche Cayenne Turbo. Yeah. Wow, ahead of yeah. your time. I didn't know they made that back then. They did, yep. I had it, um, and uh, it was great. It was perfect for Denver. It was amazing in the snow. I mean, amazing. I and And as you know, in Denver, you know, you could wake up one morning and there'll be five feet of snow on the ground. You're like, whoa, what? I got to go to football. And, right. you know, the head coach doesn't want to hear excuses. Joshua McDaniels is from New England. He wasn't going to be like, hey, everybody show up an hour late today because the snow's on the road. So you knew you had to get so there. So you had it to buy the Porsche. You know, and you I to. already had it. Yeah. It just came in handy there. It came in okay. handy. I did get one accident there in the snow, though. Had the racing tires on. Didn't realize I needed to put the <laughs> snow tires on. And I rammed into somebody's side of their uh, car as I was making a turn. So uh, a little horror story, but all good. A great car. You should know that from Jersey. There's plenty of snow out there. All right. I know. Quarterbacks. I know. You also mentioned a change there. The Broncos not in the market. They have Drew Locke, going to be a second-year player. Uh, but it was nice of you to work in a, a little bit of what I call major news here, this close to the draft, with that position at quarterback. So just to, to let everybody know what you're up to, and then you can explain your reasoning behind it, in your right. initial list, at number four, you had Tua Tungavailoa, which was as low as anybody has had Tua that, that I've sure. read about. And right. you had Jordan Love at number three. You flipped them, so now Love has dropped to four, and Tua is at three. What's behind that move right there? Yeah, well, you know, again, here, here's the thing. And, of course, uh, you know, I'm trying to watch a lot of guys, a lot of different positions, right? So – did my due diligence on these guys. I believe I stated when we did the podcast and originally that, hey, this was very close to me with Tua and Jordan Love. And full transparency, I'm not going to lie. I mean, my dad played a big part of this. He really did, Paul. What did he what say? What, are, what did he say Well, to you? he was just, you know, he gave me one of those, Christopher, Christopher. I mean, I like Jordan Love. I, I, I see what you see, but I, I don't know if you're great in this fair. I think you're – you know, I think you just, you love what Jordan Love could be. And when he said that to me, I went, mm, because this is something you got to be careful about anytime you're scouting, because you can fall in love with a player, see a certain aspect of them and go, ooh, he could be this or he could be that. Okay, but could be is different than he is that at this point. And, you know, my daddy kind of challenged me. He goes, hey, you need to go back and watch the film again. You need to watch a few games, watch a few more cut-ups, things like that. And I think his point was that it was, you know, and he's right. The Jordan Love is just a hair too raw and inconsistent at times. And I said that in my evaluation. I love Jordan Love's top-end talent, like I've told you. Right. I think he has a right. chance to be a really – if things go right and he gets in the right spot and everything, he could be a superstar. I really do believe that. But there's also just too much inconsistency – and decision making, too much inconsistency, even in the throwing. I mean, his good throws are off the charts good, but he could throw 10, 10 out routes, Paul, and you could see six different throws with those 10 out routes. And I think that started to bother me too. Now, again, I'm a believer that I think if he gets into the NFL and gets a coach and somebody's staying on him with his technique, 
You know, I think that's where I went with it a little too far, too, where I said, oh, if he gets an NFL, people will fix this, and he'll throw strikes right. every time. Yeah, I'm right. putting the egg before the chicken or the chicken before the egg a little bit there before. Tua is <laughs> certainly more consistent. You know, I understand Tua has talent. It's not a big-time arm. It's great feet. But I think it's just about playing the decision, accuracy of throwing, and consistency, I think, ultimately, that is going to make me flip-flop Tua and Jordan Love. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, you don't need a pass from me, but I'm going to give you my understanding on the Jordan Love thing because at this position and how you and I watch that and how much we can fall in love with the motion and a talent and the way a ball comes out, you step away for a day or two of watching him and you, it's, it's easy to be very, very impressed. Uh, so you're, you're dialing that back a little bit, but I want to ask you about Tua because I, I have notes here from listening to you talk about Tua. And even though it makes sense why you've backed off of Jordan even though just a little bit, uh, like, for, for example, uh, something you said about Tua, you worry about how he throws with power when people are around him and when there's chaos in the pocket. So what about that concern, even though you have moved him ahead of Jordan Love? Yeah, well, this is why, yeah, I still have that concern about Tua. That's not going away. I mean, to me, that's one of the neg more, you know, big negatives of his game, in my opinion. And that's why, I, I you know, again, I don't think, He's in the class of Herbert and Burrow in front of them. I think they're in. That was my ahead. next question. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. I think they're. Uh, to me, Paul, I look at Herbert and Burrow as the only two quarterbacks that are top ten picks. You know, for okay. me, after that, I would say Tua should go anywhere from fifteen to thirty-two, and Jordan Love can go anywhere from twenty to forty. Right? If I, you know, I, I think it's really how I would look at it that way. But that is a concern for me with Tua. Yes, you know, Tua. The one thing that scares me is, you know, can he make more with less? You know, I see right. Jordan Love at times when the play's broken down or people are in a space or nobody's yeah. open. Yeah, he'll make a throw where you go, damn, nobody right. was open, and he's still got a 20-yard completion out of it. That's unbelievable. You know, right. with Tua, yes, the vice versa there is when he has people around him and I see a Jerry Judy or a Henry Ruggs going down the middle and I go, oh, he's open, but he's going to have to make an awkward throw or somebody's in the space. He almost never completes it. I mean, almost never. He, so those to me are NFL type throws. But I think mm -hmm. within that too, like I told you with the inconsistencies with Love, I can watch 10 out routes with Love and see him go, you know, six for 10. And in those six completions, throw a variety of different balls where you just go, why? Just throw a laser in there and hit him in the chest. Tua right. does not miss those opportunities. He's a machine that way. So, yep. you know, I, I think that's ultimately – it's a cleaner game. I don't think Tua's ceiling is nearly as high as Jordan Love. I don't. But he certainly plays the position better right now and has talent. I don't want anybody right. to think I'm not trying to say that. This is a talented kid. I just have my concerns with the size, lack of big-time NFL throws, and, of course, the injury history because, like I mm -hmm. said, you can watch almost any game and go, ooh, oh, he, he's going to get hurt. Yeah. Oh, he, he's going to yeah. hurt his ankle. Oh, he's going to hurt his knee. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. a lot, and that's scary to me for a guy with his playing style. And after listening to to the one podcast that you did that was strictly about the quarterbacks, I had in my follow up notes push Chris to go ahead and make the flip flop uh, from three and four right now. And I thought your flip was going to be that Jordan Love was going to go ahead of Justin Herbert. That's how much I thought you liked him uh, based off your initial analysis. So I, I'm, I'm scratching I off know. that follow up question, and I'll, I'll think well, of something different. But that shows you, though, and it shows me, and this is where I got to be careful. I mean, I, you, you can fall into this in, in any position where, yeah, I saw some things that I really loved from Jordan Love, and I ran with it. And I just went, right. oh, my gosh, this guy could be Aaron Rodgers. Okay, but he's not Aaron Rodgers yet. And Aaron Rodgers was not that inconsistent in college and didn't do some of the things and throw the interceptions that a Jordan Love did throw and have some of the mm -hmm. incompletions where you just go, what the hell is that? So I think that's why. I mean, yes, I, I mean, I've seen him make some throws that nobody else in this draft can make. There's no doubt about right. that. But I've also miss, seen him miss some throws where I go, ooh, the top six or seven quarterbacks in the draft would be more consistent with that than you are. So those are just right. little things he's got to clean up. And you got to, of course, take the aspect of he doesn't have a lot of talent around him there at Utah State. And their offense yeah. is horrendous. I mean, it's horrible. It's, it's painful right. to watch at times, yeah. which is going to make, yeah. look, make things look ugly at times, too. It's fun to go with the reasoning behind the picks and when there are changes. Uh, you don't need to make any excuses. It's April 7th, and everybody who is good at this, most people, 
you look back at what they did in March, what they're going to do in the next couple of weeks, there are a lot of changes. These things evolve. So this is just one of them. And it's fun to hear the reasoning behind it. All right. Today's all about the edge rushers. And before we talk about the individuals and the names and what stood out when you watch tape, I, I, I want to take a step back and go a little more macro. Thinking about a week ago, Chris, we broke down the wide receivers for an hour. And that's a group that is widely believed to be the most talented group in this class. They're setting the pace. You can get a star in round one. You can get starters in round three. Okay, so that's the receivers. Edge rushers, no names, just as a group. What stands yeah. out to you? Well, I, I think the a little bit like the receivers. And I'm not going to say it's as deep as the receivers, but it was a deeper group than I anticipated with a little bit of variety of everything. Now, again, you know, uh, it, it's oddly enough, I didn't think this comparison would hold up where I'm not, you know, hey, Chase Young is a, an animal. I, I don't know if there's a, a ton of top end, oh, my gosh, this guy's a top 20, top 15 pick type guys. No, I don't think there is that. But, man, as you crack down the list, you certainly see some first-round talent, but then you get into it more and you see a lot of guys where you go, well, this guy's going to be a player for a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, he I, end of the second round, third round. You know, we got to remember guys like Zadaria Smith and Matt Judon and Kyle Van Noy, they were mid round draft picks. And now we're going, long, they're some of the best list. edge. Yeah. Right. They're some of the best edge mm -hmm. defenders in football now. And that's what I saw more than anything. I mean, a little bit of everything, too. Size guys, speed guys, you know, guys that could play outside and then move inside on third down and play like interior pass rusher on third down. Uh, so, a little more depth than I anticipated. You know, as I continued to crack through the guys, I kept just going, oh, let me see this guy. Oh, man, he's kind of, all right, let me watch 50 more plays of him because I, I need to check my, you know, you know, cover my ass here, make sure I'm not missing some guy that's going to go in the top 30 and, and I'm going to miss him. So, you know, there was uh, a lot of that, that to, to go around more than anything. And then you had some guys that were really good in one area and then had another area that was, Mm. underwhelming so you'd go wow this guy can really rush the passer at an elite level but then you'd watch him play the run and you'd go well holy crap i think yeah. i could play the run better than he can so there's yeah. a little bit of that too where situational players will come into mm -hmm. uh this conversation with some of these edge guys yeah, i'm glad you mentioned a lot of that versatility because each one of these will be a little bit different in their evaluation but i want to i want everybody including me to walk away from the evaluation of each one of these guys knowing about that versatility uh, could he play inside could he play outside could he bump to outside linebacker uh, what if he's playing on first and second down can he set the edge and play the run so i don't want to repeat the exact same question but with each one of these guys i want all yeah. of us to walk away knowing about the versatility and what they can do besides just rush the passer so uh, let's start out now with uh, your number five edge rusher well I, and i hope i say this name right because it's their hardest name of the group here but you 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 Y Yatir Grossmatos? Yatir? Y I'm going to – Yeter Grossmatos. Yeter. Yeter. Damn it. Yeter. Rhymes with go. Jeter. Okay. <laughs> I got to get that. Yeter Grossmatos. All right. So, Penn State. Yes. He, yeah. will, he will be nine number five. Now, listen. He's a guy when you turn on the film, you go, whoa, he looks the part. He's pretty amazing looking. Let me see. You know, as you start to watch the game, you go, whoa, great size, great length, pretty good first step getting off the ball. All right. Now, the film itself, though, is underwhelming to me. I was expecting more physical dominance and playmaking from, from Yeeter. I, I think that's the thing that I first came away with going, huh, I like the guy. You know, I think this guy will translate to the NFL, all right? Certainly that. He's kind of a, got nice clay, as we would say, in the NFL world. You're going to be mm -hmm. able to mold him into something. But I think between the size, the get-off, the athleticism, you know, there's some elite traits there to him overall. You know, you just don't see a whole lot of people at that size being 6'5", high 260s, being able to move right. the way he does. Now, you know, as a pass rusher, it's inconsistent at times. You know, look, right. I can take a game like Michigan and go, Michigan was down the whole game. They had to throw every play. And mm -hmm. he really didn't get many pressures in the football game. So, Would you ever take an edge rusher? I mean, even though you mentioned, and I saw the same thing, you see a lot of good traits, sets the edge well, the inside rush was good, but not exactly. great speed around the end. Would you ever use a first-round pick on a defensive end where you just said that, not a great pass rusher? 
I would not. I would not. No, I would not. And, th- you know, this is a guy, even I wrote at the end of my notes, is I wrote, bottom line, the kid's probably going to get overdrafted because of some of the traits we talked about, you know. Yeah. But you're right. You said it, Paulie. I mean, he's got great strength at the point of attack. I mean, tackles, tight ends, it doesn't matter. The run game, I even wrote down in my notes, I think the run game is the thing he does best, you know, mm. his ability to get off blocks or even just stand them up not let them move them and disengage. I mean, I liked all of that type of stuff, definitely. You talked about the inside pass pass rush move, most effective move he has. But I was disappointed in, because I see it in this guy where I go, wait, okay, I know the speed's not top tier, but he's got good speed around the edge. He does have the ability to bend, but seems not confident in going to it a whole Hmm. lot. And I think, you know, that's to me, yeah, it bothered me a little bit. I just never understood, I, you know, hey, man, take over the game. Threaten this guy up the field. Do that. So yeah. there was that. And then when you don't have that, you lack the speed to power move. Now, I right. saw it in there, but I don't see it consistently. So, mm-hmm. you know, as I look at a guy like this, yeah, I don't love this type of guy all the way. You know, I don't. Right. I think this is a really good player. But I'm careful with these type of guys. You know, this guy reminds me of Daniel Hunter, who came out of LSU in a lot of ways, all right? Very good player. or or, Very good player. Or we could take Deion Jordan from Oregon, who ended up being a bust as a a top 10 pick, right? I never know with these type of guys. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, number five pick, right. Where, you know, again, these guys sometimes – when they get in an NFL environment and they're around other alpha males and they start to learn some techniques of the position and they got a defensive Mm -hmm. line coach who's got their poker up their ass all day long, you can start to see these guys mature and thrive uh, in those environments a lot of times, like we saw Daniel Hunter. Okay. I think he was one of those guys I would say that was it. And I wouldn't be shocked to see that from Yeeter, but I don't see a guy that I'm going to say, Oh, is a top 20 pick and is going to physically dominate games, especially early on in his career. I think it's such a fine line in this process of what people hear and what they take away from it. So I hear you saying, with all caps and raising your hand, this is not a first-round pick. I don't want people to walk away and say, oh, Chris doesn't like the Penn State kid. Sounds like you would say, hey, don't take him in the first, but mid-second, this is a real value player. Then That's how fine the line is. I, I think so. That's exactly what I wrote, too. I think I just wrote, I wrote at the very end, I said, Hey, this kid is a, he's a, he's a middle, he's the second rounder all the way to me. You know, I see elite traits, the size and athleticism and length are real. I do think he'll fill out more. Hey, we got to remember these kids are, they just stop growing. Right. And when you stop Mm -hmm. growing, then you start to get thicker and stronger. And this is the guy to, to answer your question. As we started this whole thing, he does have the versatility to move inside. You know, I think Mm -hmm. he's got enough strength and power that he'll be able to take on guards. If he's, if you got to play him and say it's second and long and you want to move him into D tackle, you want to get four pass rushers in there. Yeah. He can be a handful for a guard in the, in the pass game, but also if a team decide to run a draw, he's not going to get like blown out of the water by Zach Martin right. or a Marshall right. Yonda of the world. He'll be able to ha- hold his ground and get off a block and make a play that way. So those are the things I do like about him. There certainly is versatility. I just found, mm-hmm the film to be underwhelming, I guess is what I want to say. I wish I saw more physicality from him, a little more physical right. recklessness from him altogether, the throwing your body around. Oh, there's a running back over here. Let me just jump in front of them and make the tackle. Those are the things that I didn't love about him. But again, in the NFL, when you get in that environment, you can change as a human being. And as you're growing into a man, Right. Uh, nothing wrong. I mean, when, when you go in expected to see first round talent, you got to be honest with yourself. If you see someone who's a level below that, I think your reasoning for having him as a second round kind of guy as opposed to a first is good. All right. So that's number five. Who do you have there at number four for edge rushers? Number four, I'm going to Ter- Terrell Lewis. OK, from Alabama. This is one of my favorite guys, one of my favorite watches in the draft. Uh, first off, you know, Paul, he really was. This guy was a guy where I'd heard about him a little bit you know, prior to my evaluations. And then when I turned on the film, I just went, whoa. First off, I didn't expect the guy to look like this, all right? You know, he is a high cut, high-waisted. I mean, he looks like a racehorse. Long arms, got, you know, got some muscle density you see to him. 
He's 6'5", 262, but he looks longer than that. Um, and, you know, really, okay, first off, makes a, has a lot of disruption in his game. Really good get off the line of scrimmage. Can do that. Can go speed to power. Has a spin move. I mean, the physical nature that I just said I wish I saw more from Yeeter and Penn State, I saw plenty from Terrell Lewis as far as disruption is concerned whether that was breaking into the backfield and making the quarterback get off the spot and then he has to throw it away or in the run game too. All of those mm. things really checked out. You talk about the strength in the run game, you know, he could set the edge, but was far more impressive than a guy like Yeeter getting off blocks and throwing his body mm. around. That is where I really enjoyed this kid. Now, is there a negative to his game? You know, the, the biggest negative to him is he's got a knee issue. You know, he hurt his knee in yeah. 2018, and I don't think he's yeah. totally healthy from it yet, but still able to dominate, you know, yeah. and I, I think mean, that's e the only Each of his only last thing. two years, each yeah. of his last two years, uh, not just touched by injuries, but, uh, you know, majorly touched by injuries. So sounds like you like him a lot, both run and pass. Uh, let's say a team, bottom quarter of the first round, that's already very good. They don't have to have a rush in. Luxury pick, someone uh, late 20s, uh, can you see him landing in that area? I wouldn't be shocked if a team like, let's say, the Ravens or the Titans, okay, who could use somebody on the edge of their defense to be a difference maker, he mm -hmm. would fit that fit that mold, Paul. Excuse me as I'm burping my lunch there. But <laughs> he, he would fit that mold. To me, yes, I look at him and go, this is a first-round talent. Now, the knee issue, mm -hmm. yeah, you're going to have to – there's going to be a little concern there. Where is it yeah. at right now? He still is very, very athletic, even with it. But we're talking about mm -hmm. a first-round pick. And if I had one negative about him, you know, I wish, especially from the left side of the defense, where he was reluctant to bend around that edge and put pressure mm -hmm. on that left knee at times. You certainly could see that, okay. you know. But still had enough speed to threaten people up, up field, had an inside move, had a spin move, and then – was phenomenal at that Khalil Mack, okay, I'm rushing off the edge, and then I'm going to throw my inside arm up underneath your, you know, your chin or your shoulder pads yeah. there and win with power. He was amazing at that. I mean, he really has a little bit of a versatility with his moves altogether, but the Tennessee mm -hmm. Titans, the Ravens, three, four base schemes on defense, he could be yep. a, a, a pass rusher or he could be a three, four outside linebacker. He can do any of that for you. And I think he really has an scheme? upside to him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. How about a 4 Or nickel. End? Well, he could do okay. that for sure. He could be a 4-3 rush end. There's no doubt about it. There's plenty of power to his game. Yeah. Yes, okay. there is. So I, I look at him being uh, really immune to any scheme. He's going to be able to play in just about anything there is. And I would think that, you know, another year away, he got health, he was healthy this year, that he'll just be that much more explosive. But – you know, I am really, really impressed with the overall football player. And, you know, again, I don't know if he's a first-round pick. I ended up writing he's a first-round talent with some injury concerns, but I think there's no doubt that he ends up in the top 45. Yeah, but no matter where he goes, because we're, we're not doing a mock draft. This is about where you think he belongs. Bottom half of the first round, let's say 25 through 32, you're comfortable slotting him there? I, I am comfortable with slotting him there. Yes, okay. I, I, I think this is a really, really good football player with tremendous upside uh, and has the type of ability, Paul, where, you know, from what I saw, I mean, he could be a double-digit sack guy consistently through his career. You know, the two of the okay. names I wrote down for comparison with him, I wrote he, he really movement-wise reminds me of JPP, you know, uh, Jason P Pierre Paul, yeah. Yeah. Has a similar way in which he moves around. I even wrote to Marcus Ware down as well. Wow. You know, it's it's yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I sat there for a while trying to think of like, man, who does this guy remind me of? And those are the two names that popped out to me more than anything. But yeah, he was one of my favorite, favorite watches, Paul. Inside move, good spin move, had speed to power. Um, I just want to make sure I hit it all here. You know, bend around the edge is really the only thing I wish was better is what I wrote towards the end of my notes here. And you can see if anybody wants to check out my full page of notes. You can't read Terrell it. Lewis. You can't read it. I, know. I tried. Good. I don't want you to read it anyways. 
<laughs> but I, 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 I said that was really the only thing I wish I would see more of on film was just a little bit more bend around the edge. Uh, other than that, man, is that something? Is that something that tackles uh, and everything was really good? Is that last quality that you wish he had that he doesn't something that he can learn, or is that a quality that you either have or you don't? I think he has the quality. I think it's there, right? So I saw it to go. Oh, there it is. I like it. Mm-hmm. I think the knee trust would be the thing I took away. And let's, I mean, I don't know how many plays I watched of him. I'm going to tell you I watched 150 plays or so of him. And I saw him do it on occasion, but I just think there was a reluctance to trust his knee as he was coming around the edge sometimes with just being Mm -hmm. off, like you said, two years of knee injuries. And I think that was more of the big problem than anything. So I've seen the evidence that it's possible I just want to see it more. And then once I see it more, I want to see it continue to go on the arc and the, the upward path. But uh, right. like I said, this is one of my man crushes. I wouldn't be shocked if we're talking about this guy three years from now as like one of the, the better defensive players in all of football. All right. Well done. Lewis of Alabama in there at number four. Uh, number five was Gross Matos out of Penn State, bringing us to your edge rusher number three. Yeah, well, that's where we're going to go with, uh, oh, I'm going to your school, big guy. I'm going to AJ Epinesa. Okay, did I say that right? Since uh, I, I just very well sure done on the pronunciation. Disrespect. Yeah, good. You know, good. Um, yeah. Epinesa is, I think, one of the slam dunk safest picks of the draft, in my opinion. That Even though he ran a five statement. at the combine, I mean the, yeah. the first comment out of evaluators' mouth right away before they get to his college production. Gosh, he ran over a five in the forty at the combine. He scares me. Doesn't scare yeah, you? Yeah, I. No, it it does. It does. Listen, I, I saw it. It's the first thing I write down next to his name. Dan, how good can he be? He ran a five flat, you know, a 5.04. Yeah. Um, but, okay, I think this is how you have to look at it. Now, this guy is different than, you know, the guys we talked about. Maybe he's a little bit more like Yeeter, but this guy's a different animal than really the rest of the class we're going to talk about for the most part today. You know, this guy, mm-hmm. to me, classifies as a strong side defense to end as a crash end we would call in the nfl he's not the guy that you want on the weak side with the short edge all the time this is the guy you want to the tight end side who is going to be able to handle a tight end tackle double team in the run game or do any of that but then also he's going to be great value as a pass rusher and paul you know when i turned on the film it, he plays a lot faster than 5.04. He really does. Right? He, yeah. He does. I mean, I know you watched him He looks like a 4.8 guy on tape. Yeah. Exactly. Looks like a 4.8 guy on tape all day long. I know. Yeah. All, all day long. And then, you know, you talk about power. Okay. First off, for a big guy who's 6'5", 275. And again, I think mm-hmm. he'll get bigger. He'll probably be 285 a year or two from now. You know, he's got good bend around the edge. He's got great hands. You know, he can not only just swim or swat hands away, you know, he can do the old jerk move where he kind of locks it out and then rips you and throws yeah. you back down to the ground. I mean, he's yeah. phenomenal at that. He's a really, really good football player. He's not a sexy stat machine, sack machine. That's not what he's right. going to be. He is going to be that guy that you referred to early in this, this pod, Paul. You know, defense end, but, oh, hey, this week, we're playing a team that likes to throw it 45 times. We don't, we're playing Kansas City. We don't need to worry about the run game. Hey, AJ, mm-hmm. you moved the three technique. We're going to bring in one of yeah. our smaller pass rushers. And now we have four great pass rushers on the field, too. And he won't be compromised right. in the run game because he has the strength to hold up against guards and tackles and do all that. So right. that's, that's what, why that's I what like I'm thinking. this guy. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm thinking. As, as I listen to you, it's like you're describing a very versatile defensive tackle as opposed to a defensive end. Sure. Well, I think of this guy like in the terms of Michael Bennett from the Seattle Seahawks, all right? Or yeah. or Tyrone Crawford for the Dallas Cowboys, who was drafted, I think, in the late second, maybe third round from the from Boise State. From Boise you know, State, yeah. Right, yeah. Guys that's that are – It's a great comp. Uh, that's good, yeah. I, I think that's the kind of guy he is, yeah. where on first yeah. and second down – He's going to be your strong side defensive end, and you're going to get sacks mm-hmm. and disruption out of him. And then on third down, you bring some more speed in, and you let him become an interior pass rusher. You know, I think he's got great value like that. And that's what Michael – I'm not trying to say he's going to be Michael Bennett in the NFL. Oh, that's, but Those are good pictures Michael, to think about. 
Yeah. Right. That's what he was. Michael Bennett was that guy. It was, oh, we're going to play small front. Hey, Michael Bennett, you play defensive tackle. Oh, we're going to get big. Hey, Michael Bennett, yeah. you move out to defensive end. And I think that's what he can do, let alone this final aspect, which makes him, I think, a slam dunk too, Paul, is I think he could play 3-4 defensive end, where he could play head up on an offensive tackle and be man right. enough to control that and two-gap and disengage that way. So Epinesa is really – it's not about sex appeal. This is just a right. really, really f- good football player who can kind of do yep. it all. He might be better off as a 3-4 end because that's much more about physicality and taking on blocks than a 4-3 end where you expect to get a lot of sacks. And here, Here's what I like about this case study. And remove the fact that I know we played at my alma mater. I mean, I was in the locker room with his dad. I mean, his dad was – on his way into Iowa City as I was on my way out. So I would love to see this kid do well, but he's right. kind of the poster child for, for what is unique and difficult about this draft for the evaluators. Because when you think about the 40 yard dash at the combine, it doesn't mean somebody can play or can't play, but if someone goes way faster than they were supposed to, or way slower than they were supposed to, everybody goes in their book and makes a check. I got to go back and watch film and I got to get on campus and see this guy. Is he really that fast or really that slow? So the fact that he ran a five, people were going to come to Iowa City and work him out on their own and say, I got to see his speed and quickness because it didn't show up at the combine. Now they can't get out and do that. There's no pro day. There's no individual workout. There's no finishing touch on his evaluation. So we're talking about A.J. Epinesa, but I think we're talking about a major issue with this draft for the evaluators that they have questions physically about a lot of these kids. Is he as slow as he ran at the combine? They don't get to spend the last month getting out and seeing the kid on campus and seeing if he can answer that question. It's it's huge. I mean, it's a huge aspect of this draft. You know, there's some teams that pride themselves on their ability to distinguish certain players just through the personal workout, you know, where they'll Mm -hmm. go, oh, okay, you know, hey, player A has better film, all right, than player B but it's not that much better. Let's go work them out and see what the difference is. And then they get to the workout right. and they go, Ooh, player B has some, tra- some traits that I think are going to translate better than the NFL than player A. Even though his film is better, this guy I right. think is more built and has a more you know specific skill set to our defense that we run. And now certain teams are going to lose that aspect of their scouting. And it's a huge deal. Right. It's, I, I, this is something my friends have talked to me a lot, you know, those teams right. who have the, the belief in their ability to do that, and yes. then also the teams that have what they would deem as great people skills, right? Hey, we could take mm-hmm. a chance on a, a guy who maybe has a checkered pass because, you know, we feel like we've created an environment here and I'm a head coach who knows how to handle, you know, some different personalities right. and things like that. You know, the fact that those guys aren't getting to get around some of these guys on a full day basis and going out to dinner and do the workout and get in the meeting room. Now you're not going to be able to distinguish yourself there too, to go, Ooh, should we take a chance on this guy or not this guy? Cause I'm not so sure we didn't get to spend the day with him. And I think it's right. very real right. about this draft. Yeah. It's been really fun for me. The last, uh, the last, I'd say 48 hours, Chris, I, two different GMs had such different explanations of this scenario for me. One on the younger end, you know, in the, probably in his forties, was concerned about this because he grew up in an environment of evaluation where you need that last month of finishing touches. They use that pro day. They use the individual workouts. They get great conviction from that. And all those who are used to having that, that don't have it, they're way out of their comfort zone. I talked to another GM, um, quite a bit older than us, has been around a long time. He said, you know what? This is good for us because it comes down to your ability to watch film. And it comes down to how much you trust your scouts. Because your scouts were there on campus during the season. If you can watch film and trust it, and you have great scouts on the lower level, you don't need that last month. So it's it's the same scenario. It's just two different ways of looking at it. Yeah, it is. It's it's, it's very interesting. You're right. You know, uh, it's to me, it would be unsettling to me because the look test would, would be so big. Too. You know, the right? look test Put would your hands be on. big. Yeah. yeah. Especially, yeah. you know, you know, like we're talking, like, you know, you got a guy who – okay, we got two defense ends or we got a really cro- close grade on both of them. You know, mm-hmm. some, some, my dad him. will tell the story sometimes of Bill Parcells where they weren't sure who to cut at the end of yep. training camp and Bill would just go, oh, let's just go with the, the bigger, better looking one, right? I mean, that was, that was his like, let's just go with the bigger one. He'll last the season longer, whatever it may right. be. 
You know, and those mm-hmm. are things you're not going to be able to tell without an in-person test or just looking at the guy and letting him go through some of your personal workout drills that you feel like can distinguish some of those traits. Right. Okay, so th- that brings us five through three. At five, Gross Meadows, Penn State, four, Lewis, Alabama, and three, Epinesa from Iowa. So unlike last week, Chris, I mean, there's not a lot of surprises in the top two or a name that's going to get left out. Caleb Von Chasen is your number two edge rusher from LSU. Yep. Uh, I'd like to start out with what separated him from these other three, five, four, and three, and clearly three and four, Epinesa and Lewis, you liked a whole lot. I like a whole lot. It's just this, there's no doubts in my mind about this player from what I saw. You know, as I talked with, with Lewis, where I said, oh, you know, Lewis from Alabama, I wish I just saw a little bit more bend around the edge, right? You know, with Epinesa, I go, oh, I wish he was, you know, just a hair better athlete. He's still a good athlete. And again, we're not, we can't count him as one of these top tier pass rushers. He's a different type of player than some of these guys we're talking about. But, you know, I've come away with all the guys we've talked about so far going, huh, I wish they just had this, did this one thing better. Mm-hmm. I, I don't come, these last two guys, I don't come away saying that about anything. I mean, uh, K, K. Levon, K. Levon is definitely one of my man crush leaders in this draft. First off, just tremendous explosion. I think he's the most naturally gifted pass rusher in the draft. There's no doubt wow. about it. He was the guy, when I looked at him, I just said, man, most mock drafts, they got him at 24, 25. I went, I went, you know, after the first game, I went, this, this kid's a top 20 pick. I mean, this is. How high in the it, top it, 20? How high? I, I, I wouldn't be shocked if he went in the single digits crazily to anybody. I mean, if somebody took him at eight, I wouldn't go, oh, my gosh, what a horrible pick. You know. He's better than Vic Beasley was coming out in the draft. It's not even close. Yeah. Vic Beasley right. was the seventh pick of the draft. He's better than Brian Burns was last year. It was the 15th pick of the draft. So that's just to give perspective. Now, you know, every year doesn't translate to every year because sometimes certain positions and needs, that dictates the first round. But this kid, as far as explosiveness off the ball, bend around the edge, spin mm-hmm. move, um, Speed to power. I mean, he's he was put on earth to rush the passer. You know, the names wow. I wrote down, I went, this guy's, you know, he's Von Miller. He's Derek Thomas. He's D wow. Ford. Double he's wow. that type of player. Yeah. He To me, that's yeah. the type of athlete he is. Out of long, that, let alone, a... Paul, he's got some, you know, he's got physicality to him. He throws his body around recklessly, and I really like that about him. To me, that's a big aspect of being a really good pass rusher is you got to have that physicality to you. And just listen to the, to the terms you're throwing out to describe Chase Sun, and also the ones I've written down from other guys I've talked to, burst, athletic, explosive. My favorite, and the one that makes him most unique in this class, and I think the one that translates the most to the next level, is bendy, having the bend off the edge. And I sat in the cold and watched a decade of practices at the Senior Bowl, and a lot of these guys looked the same. The one who looked different, I remember exactly how it looked, on that Tuesday and Wednesday in full pads was Vaughn Miller. He could get down like he was going to touch the ground, but he was going full speed with full power. And if you're describing the kind of bend that Vaughn Miller had, that, that is gigantic praise. It, it, it's that kind of bend, Paul. It is. You know, and yeah, Vaughn Miller's a first ballot Hall of Famer. He's that type of player. But mm-hmm. yes, and, you know, hey, you know I'm big into ass and legs. And if you want to be able yes. to turn the corner – with a 315 man push, pushing on you, you better have yeah. some ass and legs. And he is put together. And again, he's, you know, a three-year college kid. He's going to continue to grow and get stronger. But he is dense, muscled out, and incredibly twitchy. And yes, the bend to what you said is the best in the draft. You know, I, we're going to mm-hmm. talk about Chase Young here in a minute, who has been. Right. But the bend yeah. aspect is not to where Chase on is. Chase on can right. like do what you said. If he's coming around that left edge, I mean, it seems like he can get his right shoulder like a foot off the ground as he's turning the corner, yeah. which is really, really impressive. Let alone, I mean, he played in the SEC. I saw him against NFL offensive tackles. Right. And, you know, he's got the versatility. If you had to have him drop into coverage, he's phenomenal in space. You know, wow. he can break down and make tackles. And, 
for his size at, you know, the mid 250s, he's incredibly strong. I mean, incredibly. I couldn't get over the strength of the player. Like, really, he was stronger at the point of attack and taking on double teams than Yeeter from Penn State, who's a much bigger man. And I right, think that's right. where I started to look at it and just go, wow. I mean, I like this guy. And then I liked his recklessness. I did. I liked how he wasn't, oh, somebody's running through the hole. I'll just woo, throw my body in front yeah. of him and let him crush me, but he'll go down. You know, I, I'm, I'm big into that. And uh, that's where he really jumped off the screen to me. How about a concern? It's a lot of like there. What concerned you about him? You know, I, the, the concern I said, you know, because he went to the combine and he weighed 254. And then he didn't run the 40, right? And I would say mm-hmm. on film that this would be a guy that during the season, what I saw, I would think he's a low 4-5 type of athlete running the 40. Right. Yeah. But I questioned how much he weighed during the season too. I, one of the questions I wrote was how much does he actually weigh? I said, I bet he's mid-40s when he's playing a full, uh, an NFL – or, you know, this college season. I bet he's like 245. You know, I mm-hmm. wonder with him putting on the extra weight – he felt like he lost a little speed, and he said, yeah, forget it. I won't run the 40. I'll just do the things I'm good at, do the drills, show what I'm good at, and then kind of move on from there. But I think that was the only thing, really, Paul, that I looked at and went, huh, you know, it's a little concerning to me, but not not a big deal. I, mean, I think not he's certainly yet. a naturally bigger guy and stronger than, like I said, a guy like Burns or Vic Beasley, and uh, certainly a nat- more natural, explosive pass rusher. I-, I love this kid. This is one of the, my favorite players I've watched in the draft so far. It sounds like it sounds like you're describing somebody who would be worthy of a top five pick and a lot of other classes, maybe the number one edge rush title. So what is a team getting in Chase Young as we turn the corner from two to one here on your edge rush list? What are they getting in Chase Young that they wouldn't be getting in the, the wonderful player you just described? Yeah, well, Chase Young is like, he's in a class of his own. I mean, this is, you know, this is super freak territory we're talking about. You know, to be to be his size, that strong, that fast, that overpowering, to have, you know, the first step he does, uh, to have good bend. You know, his bend is not as good as uh, K. Levon, but it's still really good bend. And then I think the other thing that I just came away shocked and awed by was like, His quickness at the point of attack, Paul, you know, yes, he could win with speed. He could win with speed to power, but he could win given given the offensive tackle a shimmy move, like, and I don't even know what to call it, where he just would basically fake a bunch of different ways and then explode when he felt like, oh, I got him off balance. Let me just go now. I was amazed by his side-to-side change of direction movements at 265 pounds. Yeah, this Mm -hmm. guy is – you know, we're talking about Jadeveon Clowney, Miles Garrett, Julius Peppers type of specimen here with Chase Young. You know, if you wanted to move him to defensive tackle, he's so freaking strong. He could go, oh, okay, I'll play defensive tackle this week, coach. No problem. I'll right. be able to handle Zach. I mean, he, this guy is a freak of nature specimen, let alone a really good football player. And concern. I mean, there, there's so many compliments there. And I just asked you about Caleb on same question, but what kind of concern might you have about him? I mean, I don't know if there's any concern. You know, I don't know if there's really anything like that. I think if I was going to say, okay, um, I don't think he's the pass rusher Miles Garrett was coming out. Okay, I think Miles Garrett was more special to beat people around the edge and just as a pure pass rusher. All right, you think and Chase I think, Young you is know, a better overall prospect though? I think that he plays the run probably better than a guy like Miles Garrett. Garrett did yes especially you know if he does get in that predicament of being double teamed by a tight end or a tackle something like that he is very strong at the point of attack and can hold his ground so yes I would say he's probably better than a Miles Garrett in the run game a better pass rusher than Jadeveon Clowney but not as good as Jadeveon Clowney was in the run game right so it's a mix of that type of guy Mm -hmm. really uh but Man, Paul, like one of my favorite things to say is there just there. ain't too many people walking on around planet Earth that are built like this guy and can move like this guy. Do, do you think there should be any hesitation for the Washington Redskins after the, the Bengals take Joe Burrow? Should the should the Redskins hand in a card with Chase Young's name on it? I guess they're not handing in cards this year, but should that pick be made right away without any hesitation? 
Without any hesitation, I, I would go there. Yeah, this is a guy that just – they don't come around very often. This is a once, you know, every four, five, six years type of player, an athlete and specimen. If you're the mm-hmm. Washington Redskins, you have the chance to have Chase Young, the uh, Deron Payne, Jonathan Allen, Montez Kerrigan. Sweat, and Ryan mm-hmm. Kerrigan, where you could mm-hmm. go – I mean, our defensive front is going to be able to ruin and win some games for us alone. And that's special this day and age in the NFL. It is. So, yes, if I'm the Washington Redskins, you know, I'm going with Chase Young. He's too special that as far as just as a football player. And I think it'll give them a really, really dominant aspect of their football team. Let me see if I can tempt you with this one after listening to you talk about your second edge rusher, Caleb on Chase. And let's say that the Redskins felt about Chase in the same way you do. And someone came up at number two and said, we'll give you our first and our second this year, our first and third next year. You drop down, let's say, I'm not going to pick a specific team, but you drop down somewhere uh, between eight and 14. And you think, boy, we can get all those picks and we can probably get Chase on. Would you make that move? I probably would. Yes, I would. If you're getting, if you're getting one of those type of deals, you know, and again, I think Chase uh, Chase Young is better than Chase on, but right. not not by that many assets, not by what you just explained there. Yeah, if that happened yeah. and somebody, let's just say, was in love with Justin Herbert or Tua or something right. like that, right, and they want to make that move, I would go, go ahead, Washington Redskins, make that move. You know, mm-hmm. and especially, you know, Montez Sweat, again, he's kind of a freak of nature himself. You know, I, I'm not going to say he's Chase Young, but he has some of those freaky – ability dna traits that chase young does have you know so mm-hmm. you could have him and and a chase on on the edge and it'd still be phenomenal that way yes uh but you know just some of the things i wrote down with chase young you know i just he throws his body around again i'm big into that listen you're gonna be an nfl defense end you know you you gotta like welcome physicality and car crashes and things like that mm-hmm. you know and that's what i didn't like about yeeter right uh, he he bothered right. me that way where I wanted to go, come on, man, like throw your body around. You're you're the biggest, baddest dude out there. And right. Chase Young will throw the body around. He's immovable on the edge. I mean, immovable. Once he gets like this, night, night, it's over. I don't care who you are. He's going to lock his arms out and you're not going to move. Um, so I just look at that and just go, I, I don't see anything really negative about him at all. I wish he would use his speed rush more. Mm-hmm. All right. I think he, I think he like chickens out on it, but it's still really good. And, you know, between that, the size, the power, the speed to power, the ability to move side to side and change directions and have that little inside move that you, we talked about with Yeeter a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. that jumped off the, the page to me. I just think he's a, a slam dunk prospect. I can see somebody out there. I can hear plenty of people saying, uh, okay, if he's that great, why only two tackles and no sacks against Clemson in January? Well, okay. I mean, you know, you can watch games sometimes of a guy and go, oh, uh, why am I watching this game? He only had two tackles. And then you watch the game and you go, whoa, well, he had a tremendous effect on the game. You know, mm-hmm. you know they, they were having to double team him. He got close to the quarterback a lot, but the quarterback was throwing a quick pass whatever it may be. So, yeah, he didn't have a dominant football game there, but the Clemson Tigers were very aware of him for sure. Mm -hmm. He was close a bunch and disruptive. So I didn't come away from that looking like, oh, man, yeah, Chase Young's got a lot of issues here. No. You know, college football, you could see, you know, it's read option. It's screen to the receiver. It's a short pass. Mm -hmm. It's a screen to the running back. And you could see a defense end beat his guy six, seven plays in a row, but you just go, man, the quarterbacks, they don't have the drop back pass game the NFL does. They don't hold the ball that right. way. And it's hard to get consistent pressure and sacks that way all the time. I could show you people, you know, with a lot of sacks and go, yeah, that's great. But they're like, they're, they're bullshit, they're bullshit sacks, you know, right. where, oh, well, the, the right. quarterback yeah. scrambled and then he got off the block and made us made a tackle, you know, four inches behind the line of scrimmage, and he got a stack mm-hmm. for a sack. And you go, well, he really didn't beat his guy. It was a coverage sack. Right. But he got the sack, and, you know, we make a big deal about, oh, look, he got 12 sacks this year. <laughs> and I want to go, yeah, there's guys in this draft that I saw that got seven, eight, nine, ten sacks. 
you know, and I yeah. watched them and I went, yeah, that's great. But like only four of the sacks were like sacks that I would consider, wow, he beat his right. guy and did what you have to do in the NFL to get to a Tom Brady or an Aaron Rodgers. Couple of things here, Phil. I knew, uh, Phil, Chris, I knew I could yeah. bring out the inner Phil. I knew I could bring out the inner Phil in you with the voice by bringing up a stat. And second, I, I got to tell you, Chris, I'm, I'm a little disappointed with your response there because I laid it out there perfectly for you for you to use your favorite defensive end stat that is the only play yours. Up. Yeah, the you play didn't use up. it. I know. Didn't have a sack. I don't know what, but I was a chicken, right? What a, what a chicken I was there. I know. Be better You're right. I don't time. know why I didn't do that, but. Uh, either way, the guy's a special player. He's going to be a force in the NFL for 10 years or more. He's not going anywhere. And, you know, again, it's just another guy, you know, just like Chase on or Yeeter or any of those where I just go, you know, no disrespect here. These are kids. They're, mm -hmm. they're going to continue to get bigger and stronger and more physically right. explosive. And I think we can't forget that, you know, I mean, Chase Young, I really like him. He's got tremendous upside. I don't think he's as good as Nick Bosa coming out of uh, Ohio State last year. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. Now, I think his, I think he's got more play strength. He's better against the run. He's not as good a pure pass rusher as Bosa was. That would be the only thing I would say. But, again, you get a guy like this in an NFL environment around other alphas and the coach right. calling you out on a daily basis, and you're starting to be in a meeting room with other guys that are really talented, you know, this is a guy that I think, you know, the, 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 the what do I want to say? The sky's the limit for, for Chase Young. All right, let, let's run through the top five. And while I'm doing this, Chris, you can locate a couple, maybe three other names of guys that almost made your list that you want to talk about. But at number one, no surprise, Chase Young, Ohio State. Caleb on Chasen, LSU was number two. And I think one of the real surprises in listening to you is how close you have him to Chase Young. I've heard so much about the drop off between one and two. Uh, I liked how close you have those two, or I guess how much you like Chase on two. At uh, number three, Epinesa from Iowa. Four, Lewis from Alabama. You really like three and four a whole lot. It sounded like you think they could be first round picks. And then one, you weren't quite as sold uh, with his first round potential, but you did have at number five, Yeter Gross Matos from Penn State. Uh, so those are the five names we hit. Uh, if you want to yep. throw out a couple other names, the guys you really like, now's the time. Well, Florida, Jabari Zuninga. All right, number 92, okay. anybody out there, you want to watch an interesting film. To me, that is a guy that had elite traits, Paul. You know, again, I'm big into elite traits in the first round. Right. You know, you got to be doing something physically elite. We can't talk – we can't start with, like, oh, he's a winner or, you know, <laughs> or, oh, right. he's a good football player. When you start to say things like that, then it tells me, oh, he's not as good as you're, you're saying is because you'd be able to point to something. Like when you talk right. about Odell Beckham Jr. coming out in the draft, you went, man, he can fly. Or, you know, Chase Young, mm -hmm. man, is he powerful coming off the edge, right? When you start to talk about other right. things, you're, you're, you're bullshitting for some reason to try to find a reason to like the player. But Zeninga, right. Right. I don't even know why I went there, first off, has incredible explosion and twitchiness. He's a little stiff, Paul. He was played mm -hmm. out of position at Florida. They played him a defensive tackle, which speaks to his strength at mm. 260 pounds. All right. Yeah. But when he got on the edge, he was one of the better pass rushers I saw in this draft. And I think he's going to be on the edge. And he's definitely going to be on the edge in the NFL, Paul. You know, Florida was in one of those things where they were trying to get the best 11 guys on the field. And because he yeah. had such good play strength, he became, you know, the fall guy where they said, you move inside. And I want to look at the Florida coaches and go, well, you know, I get it. But I want to go, your best pass rusher now is not a pass rusher. And I don't understand mm -hmm. that. But hmm. bend, explosiveness, power, obviously, if he can play defensive tackle in the SEC on a week-to-week -week basis. He had a bad high ankle sprain this year. He didn't get to play a lot. But, man, did he pop off the film to me, Paul. He really is special. And I would think he is some guy that goes certainly in the second round. Yeah, strong pass rush. And because, as you pointed out, because he played defensive line, he can do that as well. Thought he struggled in the linebacker-ish kind of drills at the combine. So yes. maybe lacks some versatility there. but. If you're Definitely getting him in does. the second round, I mean that's that's uh, that's all good. But okay, you're Zeninga, right, though, Paul. That that's it. He's a true he's a true D end that way. Yes. Whether you want to make yeah. him a strong side defense end or weak side defense end, hey, you'll see when you get him doing NFL camp. But yes, you're right. He's not an outside linebacker. We're gonna drop him into coverage, do that thing. Right. No, he's not. 
a lot of his movements remind me of Michael Strahan. That's the guy I wrote down. I said, damn, I watched Michael Strahan up here in New York for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And the way he gets off the ball and kind of moves is very similar to him. I would not be shocked if he's a guy that's towards the top of football two years from now in, in sack production. Okay, that's uh, Jabari Zaninga, Florida. Who else? Who else do you have there? Well, you know, a guy that you and I are very familiar with, Julian Aquara. Okay, I want to hit yeah. on this a little bit because Aquara – is a really natural pass rusher. He's one of the more mm -hmm. natural pass rushers in the whole draft. I mean, he really is. I think you could put him up there just far as, you know, I'm not saying he's as physically elite as, you know, Chase on or Chase Young, but just as far as, you know, being a guy that can win with speed, bend, have a power rush, have speed to power, do all of that, Julian Okwara is a natural at that. He is. Now, the reason mm -hmm. he doesn't make my top five is, you know, lack of physicality, and he's really underwhelming in the run game. You know, he really yeah. gets pushed around and has a hard time getting off blocks. So, you know, again, he's a guy that I think it will probably end up in the second round because of his ability to rush the passer. But Sounds right. Yeah. I think you're, you're, you're going to have to be choosy about where you use him, I think, especially on, early on in his career so he can kind of build up his size and his play strength a little at the point of attack. And they, they were pretty strictly four-man front there at Notre Dame the last couple of years under Clark Lee. Highly productive, but when it comes to versatility and moving him around, yeah, we didn't get to see a whole lot of that in South Bend. No. He was truly an edge guy. You know, he really yeah. was. You're right. He wasn't the guy that they ever moved in and said, oh, it's third down. We'll put you a defensive tackle and see how you uh, – handle you know handle the workload there no he's not he wasn't capable you know like I said it, it, there's too many plays where I just go Julian this tight end has got you four yards down the field like get off the block or stop him or do something mm. like that and you know just didn't get off the block or seemed content being blocked whatever it may be it just wasn't good enough there and not enough physical strength for me to say oh this is a first round talent but there is there is something to like about his pass rush ability, and I think that's what he'll be early on in his career. He'll be a mm -hmm. a, a, a pure pass rusher that they hope can, can develop into a, a three-down defense end at some point. Only two other names I have written down that I know might interest you, the Taylor out of Tennessee and Uche out of Michigan as well. I think those are the – that I think, you know, once we hit those names, I think we've hit the big names. Um uh, Mm -hmm. Uche, okay, and I, is, it, is that how you say it? Uche, is that is that correct? I think it's I think it's a hard ch. I think it's Uche. He is a really interesting prospect. Um, Josh Uche, Uche, number six. All right, or mm -hmm. yeah, Uche. He is a hybrid stand-up linebacker slash pass rusher. Paul, it's rare okay. to say that. And trust me, when I turned on the film, I said, "Man, this guy." He's not big enough to be effective off the edge. Like, there's just no way. He's 6'1", 245. Well, <laughs> me, I was wrong. I was wrong because <laughs> he has legitimate pass rush ability. He does. I mean, he's kind of like the Tasmanian devil. He's got great strength. He is fast as hell. I mean, he can really turn the corner. And when he knows he's turned the corner, he can hit another gear to go pursue the quarterback and tackle him. Uh, and, so he can beat know, NFL tackles. I, I think he can, not on a first and second down basis. I think he's a guy, again, where it's going to be pass rush value, and then you hope he could be a linebacker on first and second down. You know, a guy okay. that could be a stand-up linebacker, and then, hey, it's third and 12. We know they're going to throw it. You know, let's bring a third safety in the game. Now we'll only have one linebacker. Let's move Uche, okay, to, to, to weak side defense to end and let him just be a bat out, of, bat out of hell and scream off the edge. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw a lot of, like, my Elvis Doomerville, who I played mm -hmm. with in Denver. Remember mm -hmm. Elvis Doomerville? Yeah. Kind of the player. same size, but a yeah. similar, in, similar in theory that way, where it's just like it doesn't make sense to be that size, and how the hell can he be that strong? Uh, but mm -hmm. he is. He's strong enough to kind of set the edge and handle his, handle his own when he needs to be, but extremely explosive and athletic around the edge. Very interesting prospect. I don't even know where to list him as a defensive end or as a he's, linebacker at this point. 
He's kind of a tweener. And once you get out of the, the first and second round where you want to have, as you say, elite traits at those positions, if, if you're a mid-round guy and they're not quite sure what to do with you, but they, they know you can rush the passer, I mean, that's, that's kind of perfect for a third and fourth round. Uh, with the ability to do a number of things will get you in your camp and we'll see what you can do. And it is, it is Uche. It is the hard CH, Josh Uche. Uche. Okay. Okay. Put a period I got on that. him Uche. that way. Yeah. Okay. And then awesome. Taylor from yeah, Tennessee. But, uh, really fun. Yeah. D- uh, Darrell Taylor, you know, muscle power based football player who, again, really has a natural pass rushing bend to his football game. The only thing he lacks overall is just great explosiveness or speed or burst. But I Which think is why you're is not talking that, about him in the first round. Exactly right. That's really all it comes yeah. down to. There's really – his mm-hmm. game, it checks a lot of the boxes. It does. It's unbelievable play strength. He can set the edge. He's pretty good tackler in space. Knows how Real to good use against his hands the run. a little bit. Yeah. Right. He's really good against the run. He is. He's a man. He's a Baltimore mm-hmm. Ravens type outside linebacker, just to paint a picture mm-hmm. for somebody. He's that way. Mm-hmm. If, if we were four years from now saying, hey, this guy you know, is going to be franchised by the Ravens as the new Matt Judon or something like that, I would go, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I could see that. I do. I, yeah. You know, it just, just lacks that first step explosiveness and this is that overall top speed to be in the top five conversation. But I think a guy that goes anywhere from the mid-second round to the mid-third round and has a long career in the NFL. Chris, I'm going to say that it's always fun to talk ball with you, but this was encouraging for the rush end class. Uh, a couple of things stand out. How close you have Caleb Levon Chase on uh, at number two to your top guy, to everybody's top guy, Chase Young. I thought it was fun to listen to that. And your description of the depth and the kind of players you can get late first, um, two through four with these last few guys we've talked about. Yeah. Uh, encouraging is, is the word that comes to mind. So uh, well done, man. That was fun. That, thanks, man. It was fun. It was a good list, and there's a lot of team that have edge rusher needs in this draft, and you know that's why I think you'll see a run on the, a run on these guys in the first 96 picks of the draft. I think you're going to see a, a number of them picked certainly, and yeah, you know, again to 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 kind of put a stamp on it, you said it. Chase Young's my number one guy, mm-hmm. but I think people, and I'm not trying to say K. Levon Chase on is on his level. But right. I think people are kind of sleeping on him a little bit about you where didn't he's have him go that far out. Other I, people I, yeah, led I, me I, to believe that there was a bigger gap than you did. I you know, good, well, good. Uh, you know what? I love him, and I think he is a top fifteen, certainly top twenty talent in the draft, uh, with a lot of versatility, upside. One of my favorite watches. But yeah, I think between Young and Chase on, you could get two superstar sack output type of pass rushers in this year's draft. And you also like Lewis, Alabama, and Epinesa from Iowa, I think better than, than some others as well. So I'm going to keep an eye on those two. And you're making the turn from defense events to running backs later in the week, I understand. I am Thursday. We're going to do top five running backs. And again, really impressive group. The more I go down the list, I start to go, damn, here's another good one. Damn, here's another good one. So uh, it it's, looks like there's some depth at the position, but certainly out of the first six, seven guys I've watched and studied, yeah, I've really liked what they've brought to the table, which is scaring me to go, there's going to be no running back drafted in the first round in this year's draft, I think is where I'm st- uh, heading in that conversation right now. But yes, Thursday podcast, running back ranks, and of course, we'll talk about some other guys outside of the top five who at least jumped out to me as well. Well, in the last hour and a half, and the, the first thing happened before we actually came on the podcast, but you, you've had your young son bring you lunch and go to the basement to retrieve things you've stolen in the past. So you can go back to your fine parenting now for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much. I'm done for the day. I'm going to go get a workout, and I might have a drink or something, and then call you it go. quits for the day. I've been going hard since about 5.45 this morning, but you the man, you Paulie B. Always Good enjoy you, man. it, man. You uh, way to question me. I love your insight. Way to bring bring your A game, dude. And uh, hey, everybody out there, be safe, be good. Thursday's podcast, running back rankings. We'll get to it. We're going to continue our draft talk throughout the Chris Sims on Button podcast leading up to the NFL draft, which is now almost two weeks away. All right, everybody, say bye, Pauly B. All right, see you next time. Peace. I'll be listening Thursday, and I'll see you next week. All right, see you. See everybody. Be good. All right, man. See ya. See ya.
Yo, yo, what's up? Come on, man. Subscribe on YouTube to Chris Sims Unbuttoned Podcast. I need you. Please hit the subscribe button, please.